want to welcome you to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. It's a blessing to be with you again this morning. We're going to be continuing our series, which I've titled Bringing the Gospel to Mars Hill. And I started this last week looking at Acts chapter 17, where the Apostle Paul arrives in the city of Athens on a second missionary journey. There, the Bible tells us that his spirit was stirred when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. This was very much the center of the religious world. Mars Hill itself was filled with temples and altars and every religion that you could find in the Roman Empire, in the Roman world. But they didn't know the true God. Well, the Lord brought Paul there so he could stand there in the midst of Satan's heartland and proclaim the true gospel. Reveal the true God. As we studied last week, there were many that mocked. Most did. But the Lord touched several hearts and changed several lives. And above all, God was glorified. It's a wonderful story. But we didn't look at that simply to read about what happened for Paul. The reason that I got into Acts 17 was kind of to lay the foundation of a whole series where we consider the Mars Hill that is around us. I want in the weeks to come to begin to look at different religions in the world around us. And I'm doing this for two different reasons. First of all, Christian, I want you to appreciate the absolute truth that God has given you. As you look at all these other beliefs, these other religions, these other ways, I want you to firmly be established in your heart, in your mind, that you know the true way. That there is no gospel that compares to the true gospel. The other aspect of this is that we need our spirit stirred, like Paul's was. Because the world around us is wholly given to idolatry, and God has brought us here to shine His light. So we want to consider how we can do this and be a witness of the only true God. This week, as we get into the study, I want us to look particularly at Mormonism. Now, before I begin to get into some of these doctrines, some of these beliefs, I do want to say a quick word to any who may be watching this video that are of that belief. It's not my goal to build up a straw man and tear it down in pride or hatefulness. I want to give an accurate description of what you believe, and I hope that you would agree with that. But my goal is to show Mormonism how it stands next to the Bible. Unlike a lot of religions that we will be talking about in the weeks to come, Mormonism doesn't deny the Bible, but it adds to the Bible. What Mormonism teaches is that there is another testament of Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon. And so we want to see this and get into it. And as we do, you're going you're gonna, to, I hope, understand that this does not support the Bible. It actually denies the teaching of the Bible. But before we get into those teachings, let's look at the founding. Let's look at how Mormonism came to be. It began with a young man named Joseph Smith, who in the 1820s claimed to receive great visions and revelations from God. And one of the first revelations that he received from God was an understanding that Christianity had left, as it professed in his day, had left the true faith. Later, an angel named Moroni came to him with some ancient golden tablets. They contained a new message for him, a true divine message. And this became the Book of Mormon. Over the years, he would add from other visions that he claimed, uh, even a supposed translation from an ancient Egyptian manuscript. So there was continual truth that he claimed to receive from God. His enthusiastic teaching reached many people that were looking for new experiences, new truth, maybe frustrated with where they were in religion. And so he gained a following from this. And for the next 20 years, 
the Mormon congregation that he led would go from city to city trying to find a, an area where they could establish their own community and build their own temple, but they faced opposition wherever they went. Until finally in 1844, Joseph Smith was killed in a battle with a mob in Carthage, Illinois. Following Joseph Smith, Brigham Young took up the leadership of this group. And he also claimed divine revelation and brought new teaching and new supposed truth. He also established much of the current leadership structure that's there among the Mormons. Very significantly, he would lead them west to establish a community in Utah and throughout many of the western territories. Today they have 15 million members in 29,000 congregations. Their doctrine is published in 200 different languages, and they regularly send out 84,000 missionaries. So it is a very, very much a, a great worldwide religion today. It's expanded in many ways. That's a very brief history. What I really want to focus on, though, is to show you how Mormonism stands next to the Bible. Specifically, how many of their core beliefs are unbiblical. The first thing that I want to show you is that they have a progressive truth. This religion began when Joseph Smith claimed a new revelation from God. The Bible wasn't denied, although Joseph Smith claimed that it was inaccurately translated and he sought to retranslate it himself. But the Book of Mormon was an additional truth that was added to the Bible and it was given directly from God through the prophet Moroni. Later he would add again other truths he claimed that were given from God such as the doctrines of covenants and the pearl of great price. Here's a quote from the latter of those works. It says, We believe all that God has revealed all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Even today, the leadership of the, of the Mormon church is claiming new revelations that set forth new doctrines from God for the congregation to follow. And some of these have changed vastly over the years and even contradicted previous divine messages. Now, we're going to have more to say on this in a little bit, but I'll just say here, when you have progressive truth, you strip the truth of its true power. How can we trust a God whose commands do not stand the test of time? How can we rest upon a gospel that may not be the gospel tomorrow? I need a truth that never changes. But we'll talk more about that in a minute. I also want you to see that the Mormons have a vastly different idea from the Bible about who God is. They have a created God. Joseph Smith brought this out in a sermon in 1844. He says, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. God the Father was a created human that achieved deity by his works, by his own righteousness and abilities. Now there's little information about the God that created him or the God that created that God or where everything began. But this is kind of the mentality. God was once as we were. And he had a wife with whom he produced Jesus as his natural offspring. Jesus himself, the son through faithfulness, was also exalted to Godhead. Mormonism is polytheistic. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, these are three different gods. And what's more, there's a lot, there's many more gods. In fact, man himself seeks to progress to deity, seeks to himself become a god. Here's a quote from Lorenzo Snow, the fifth president of the Mormons. It says, as man now is, God once was, as God now is, man may be. So that's a vastly different view, as we will see from the Bible's message about the one true God. But then I want you to see thirdly, they have a man-centered gospel. Now on the surface, if 
some of the Mormons come to your door and begin to talk to you and you ask them about what they believe, you may find what sounds like a similar message to Christianity. Jesus came to save fallen man. He was born with a physical body that he might obey the Father and atone for our sins in his death. But how is it that man receives the atonement? Well, here's a quote from their Articles of Faith. It says, We believe that through the atonement of Christ all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. One other quote I'll give you is from the Book of Moroni in the Book of Mormon. It says, If ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, might, mind, and strength, then is His grace sufficient for you, that by His grace ye may be perfect in Christ. So here is man by his works. Yes, he receives the atonement when he earns it by his own righteousness specifically by his baptism, by the laying on of hands, by adherence to Mormon teaching and through good works to others. So that atonement is something that we receive by what we do, not by what Christ accomplished. He gave us the opportunity to be saved by our works would be the best way to describe that. But then the, the Mormons have a very different view of what occurs after death. Namely, they believe in salvation after death. I've got a chart here for you. This is from a track printed in the 1950s that illustrates how, in their mind, the afterlife takes place. Those that die outside of the faith are sent to spirit prison. You see the red line there. But this is not an eternal hell. It's a prison. And there they can be taught by spirit missionaries, faithful Mormons that go into the afterlife and go to that spirit prison and preach the correct doctrine. And those that repent can yet be saved from there. And in fact, loved ones that are yet alive can be baptized on behalf of those that have died without the faith. And so by these things, repentant souls there in spirit prison can be worthy of heaven. Now they believe in three stages of heaven. There's multiple heavens. You see there at the bottom, there is the telestial heaven. Now this is not ultimate hell, but it lacks the true glory of the greater heavens. So that's the lowest stage. But then there is the terrestrial. This is for good and moral people who were not as faithful as they could be to the Mormon teaching, but they were still good people. They achieved to the terrestrial. The highest is the celestial heaven. Here are three stages, as you can see, in this heaven. And those that attain to the highest of those three stages can themselves become a god as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are. I'll give you another quote. This is from Joseph Smith. He says, This is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you've got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another, and from a small capacity to a great one, and from grace to grace, and from exaltation to exaltation. So they're seeking this progression, and even after you die, you have that hope to progress upward until you reach that God-like status. Outer darkness... That's not on the chart, but that was a place reserved for Satan and his angels, as well as any Mormon that rejects and turns from their true faith, as they would say. That's their beliefs, and I told you it's unbiblical, but I want us to look specifically at the Bible and what the Bible teaches in light of these things. And I want to start with the, with the mindset that the Bible alone is God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter. 3 and verse 16 tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now when I read that verse, I believe that that is talking about this book. All 66 books contained in our Bible. That's what 2 Timothy 3 is talking about, not a new revelation, not some other book that we haven't found yet, but what we have here. Now, why do I believe that? 
Well, more than anything, because this is a complete truth. When you truly read it with all your heart and your mind and, and you meditate on it, and as God reveals it to you, you begin to understand you can't add anything to it. It is a perfect truth. It is complete. It tells us everything we need to know about God. It tells us a complete message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And it reveals how we are to follow the Lord. And anything that you end up adding to this is going to corrupt it. It's perfect truth. I believe and I think it is very biblical to understand that the Bible alone is God's word and we do not look for any new truth. We rest our lives on this truth. But then what does it teach? Well, it teaches, first of all, that there is one eternal and sovereign God. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10, the Lord says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. God clearly proclaims throughout the Bible, that's just one of the passages, that He is the only true God, not one of many. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There are no other gods. I alone am He. Jehovah is the source and the sustainer and the ruler of life. Genesis 1.1 teaches in the beginning God. He was the great I Am, the one who was there in the beginning, the uncreated God from whom all life all things come, and He is the sustainer of all those things. He's almighty. He's unchanging. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's perfectly holy, and He's unconditionally loving to His people. There is no man, no being, no imagined God that can compare to the true God of this Bible. Now, the Son and the Spirit, I will add, these are persons of the same Godhead. 1 John 5, 7, for three, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is Christ, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, which is a message of the Trinity. And that's a deep subject and a lot for us to get into, but I want you to understand the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not three different gods. They're three persons, but one God. Three in one. If you weaken God, even a little bit, I tell you, that makes him unworthy of our trust. I don't want to just put my hope in one of the gods. I don't want to put my hope in someone who achieved God's status in some way, but was once weaker and may once not be, one day not be what he is. I need an eternal, true, all-powerful God to put my hope in. And the Bible exalts him in that way and calls us to put our trust in him. But then, number three, there are two eternal states of man. The Bible makes it plain and simple. There is a, a heaven and a hell. There is eternal glory with Jesus Christ, and there is a lake of fire. Jesus, when he talked about Lazarus and the rich man, didn't talk about a spirit prison. Lazarus was brought up by the angels into glory. That rich man awoke in torment, from which he was told there was no escape. We read in Romans chapter 2 and in verse 6 about God who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Our path to our eternal state takes place in this life. You die in your sins, you die condemned without hope. But if I die in Jesus Christ, I have an eternal hope. Now is the time to repent and receive the gospel. There's no hope. After this life is the judgment. So there's two eternal states of man, and the path we take to those is here, now in this life. But then number four. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We're going to go through this again and again. You're going to hear the gospel, according to the Bible, over and over in this series. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that. Well, one of the reasons we're doing that is because it reveals 
the hopelessness of man's false gospel. All these other ways of man, we're going to see them one after the other. There, Man is looking to have control himself. He's looking for something that he can do. He's looking for some sacrifice, some work, some religion that he can offer to God and find himself worthy of atonement or worthy of salvation, worthy of blessing. Deep down, it's man wanting that control. It's man wanting the glory. And in fact, in Mormonism, well, you can even be a god yourself. What's more glorious than that? But that's a far cry from the humbling message of the Bible. The Bible teaches that we're sinful creatures. That we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth right. No, not one. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's the Bible's message. And it teaches us that we cannot be saved by the works of the law. We cannot be justified by those works, as it says in Galatians. It's a humbling message. It turns us away from self-hope, from any self-confidence. But that's not given to beat us down and to doom us, but to point us to our true hope. It's not by works that we can do, it's by God's wondrous grace. Ephesians 2 verse 8 tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Though I'm unworthy, though I have no work or religious ritual or offering to appease God, in His grace He's purposed to save me. Sovereignly, lovingly, He chose me before the foundation of the world. And He gave His Son to pay the very real price for my sins on that cross. And Jesus fulfilled that work and He suffered and took the full punishment that I deserved. Paid it in full. And He's risen again having paid that price. Now Jesus ever lives as a testament to my salvation. That price is paid. I don't come to God hoping I can do something to earn that. I come to God and I cry out to Him for His mercy and I put my trust and hope in His love knowing Jesus died for me by faith. Forsaking all, I trust Him. I cling to Christ. And that's my eternal hope. I don't have to worry if I've done enough. I know Jesus has finished it all for me. There is no religion that compares to that true gospel. What a wonderful thing to know it in our hearts. And we do what is right, not to earn God's salvation, but because we have this loving relationship with Him today through Jesus Christ. Let me close with a quick word to the believer. How do we respond to Mormonism? Well, number one, I want to encourage you to have a testimony like the Bereans. In Acts chapter 17... Before Paul went to Athens, he went to Berea and he went to the synagogue and he began to, to preach the gospel to the people there. And it's said of them in Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. They didn't just take Paul's word for it. They judged him by the scriptures, which they already had. That's talking about the Old Testament scriptures. They began to have them read out, and they began to look at them. Do these Old Testament scriptures teach about a Savior that would come and die for the sins of His people and atone for their sins with His blood? Do these prophecies of that Messiah reveal that Jesus of Nazareth was that one? As they began to study it out according to Scripture, they found that what Paul taught was true. God opened their heart and they believed. But this is our calling. This is what I want from Carmichael Baptist Church. This is what I want from everyone who watches these videos. And I know this is what Pastor Brown, who preaches after me, what he desires. Be like those Bereans and judges by the Word of God. We're not coming to you with a new revelation. We don't want to come to you with our philosophy or our ideas or what we think might be true. I want to tell you what God has revealed in the Bible, and I want you to judge me by the Bible. And I would say this to everyone out there, that when somebody comes to you, they come to your door or they talk to you at work or you're sitting in a congregation listening to preaching, judge that message by the Bible. Only through God's Word can we see truth?
Can we understand that something really is true? And we need to look at every other message in the light of it. But then we need to know it in our hearts if we're going to do that, don't we? We need to be in it daily, and we need to be prepared to be a light of that truth to this world. This is my next point, and my final point. We need to be a loving witness. You know, particularly when you delve into differing beliefs from yours, there's a temptation to kind of go on on the attack. And some people like to debate more than others. But an attitude like that can sometimes be very dangerous. It puts somebody back on the defensive and they hold more than ever to to what they believed because they're trying to defend it. What the Mormon needs is the simple truth of Jesus Christ. They need to hear of a Savior who truly saves. They need to hear of a relationship with God and a a spirit of love that drives our obedience, not any kind of a selfish desire or hope for our personal blessing, but simply because we love the Lord and are blessed in Him. And they don't need to just hear your words. They need to see this in your life. They need to see the testimony of someone who has that relationship with God and has that eternal joy in Him. you got to be living that out every day. Now, there are many so steeped in their false belief they're not going to see it. In fact, no man left to himself can They can't let go of their self-righteousness. The God of this world has blinded their eyes so they can't see the light of the gospel. But it is God that changes hearts. And He's working just like He did in Acts 17 with Dionysus and Damaris who ended up cleaving to Paul and his truth there in Athens. He works in the same way today as we preach the gospel. Our role is to stand firmly on the Word of God and to proclaim His truth and to, to... Shine His light wherever we go. I pray that is a blessing to you, an encouragement to you today. And I want to just encourage you believers to stand for this truth, be a witness of it, and I hope you'll give attention to it, whoever you are, and judge your beliefs, your hopes, by the Word of God. It's been a blessing. We look forward to being with you again next week. May the Lord bless you.